Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast and get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome back Scott Abramson. He's a neurologist, and today's Kevin MD article is titled The Myth of Compassion Fatigue. Scott, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. I'm a retired neurologist, by the way. All right. So, <laughs> You've, Scott's been on multiple times, so just go to kevinmd.com slash podcast and go to the upper right-hand corner. There's a search bar. You can look up his name for his prior episodes and story. But today's, let's uh, jump right into it, the myth of compassion fatigue. So how did this article and story come together? Well, Kevin, I think I've told you before, I'm kind of like an opposite guy. So if somebody says, you know, A, I'm thinking B, and it's just sort of my nature. And I was impressed that so many people were writing so many articles to you. And in one way or another, they were talking about compassion fatigue. They use that term, compassion fatigue, compassion fatigue. Now, I take that to mean that, that we as physicians are, are naturally so filled with compassion that we've just used it all up, that we see these patients, you know, with horrible things and this and that, and all our compassion just gets drained and our compassion tank is empty. The meter is down to like zero. So we've given out all this compassion and we've just got nothing left to give. And of course that feels bad because we are idealistic people and we believe that we're supposed to have compassion for everybody. But you see, Kevin, I, don't, I think that's a myth. I think it's a lie we tell ourselves. I don't think that our compassion tank is drained. I don't think that we've used up all our compassion. I don't think we have any compassion to give at all. And I don't think we have the time or the inclination to give compassion. You know, I have a colleague, Kevin, who uh, a hardworking OBGYN doctor. She comes home one night. Her husband is there. He's had a rough day at work. He's not a physician or anything. She comes home and he's looking for a little TLC. She looks at him and says, I'm sorry, honey, I gave it the office. But the thing is, she didn't give it the office. We don't give it the office because we just don't have the time or the inclination. And Kevin, let me just, I'll say one more thing about this is I'm not, I'm not telling you this out of review of data or lectures I've heard or anything. I'm telling you this from self-examination because when I think about when I think about my my own practice, I ask myself, and and when I, in the article I wrote, I asked people to consider in the in the days patients that they've seen, mm -hmm. what percent of those patients did they feel a genuine compassion for? And when I examine myself, like on a great day, it's maybe five percent. That's it. We work in this environment where it's just you know we, we're seeing a patient. There's there's three in the waiting room. There's about 10 e-consults to answer. There's staff messages, phone calls to make, jury excuses, all these kind of things. We just don't, we don't have the time or even the inclination to, to give any compassion. It's like, Kevin, I, I don't know whether, it's, it's not compassion fatigue, it's physician inbox fatigue. And I don't know whether you remember seeing those old, old I Love Lucy shows. But Lucy's in the chocolate factory and these things are coming down. And, you know, how can we're, we're in that world? We're in the it's Lucy in the chocolate factory fatigue. We're just waiting for one, you know, more, you know, thing on the assembly line of EMR data coming down that we have to address. So you're saying that physicians aren't necessarily having compassion fatigue because all the non-clinical burdens that they have to endure, whether it's inbox, EMR, bureaucracy, checklists, and all that, that's preventing them from giving compassion in the first place. Is, is that right? And that, that's, yeah, that's basically what I'm saying. We are just so, we are just so preoccupied with everything else. And I think, Kevin, that there's two kinds of circumstances where we're not giving compassion. And the first is, is where compassion, I guess you could say, is appropriate. It should be given. And we feel, and we feel guilty that we don't. So in other words, like this would be the kind of patient that I would see in, in when I was in neurology, let's say a mom with multiple sclerosis, she comes in in a wheelchair and her nine-year-old daughter is, is helping her change diapers. 
when I see a patient like that, I mean, boy, that just that just tears at your heart. But I would find that, wait a minute, I, I just don't have time for that. There's three people out in the waiting room. I've got to get to the inbox, do this. And, and I feel bad about that. I feel guilty that I wasn't able to feel any compassion in that moment. So those are the ones we feel guilty about. And then there's the other kind, I think, that that we don't feel that guilty about. And these are the run-of-the-mill patients. These are the patients, you know, with chronic low back pain, with chronic headaches, with a, a nighttime cough that's been going on forever. And in those patients, we just don't have the inclination to give compassion. In the first case, it's we just don't have the time and we don't have the, in the, in the inclination. Now, I know some people are going to hear this. They're going to be upset. They're going to, and if, if you are feeling genuine compassion with the majority or most of your patients, I mean, God bless you, really. You're, I, I admire you, but I just have to look inward. And when I examine myself, that was not the case with me. Now, when you were practicing, how did you handle that tension where you have all of these things that would rob you of your compassion? How, how did you handle that? That's a great question. That's a great question, Kevin. And I think a lot of times I would rationalize it. I would say, well, you know, you should, but you know, you, but look, look, look what you're up against. Look at, look at all this, look at the burden you have to deal with. So you know, it's understandable. You, you know, you will give you a hall pass for this. I think in some way I may have said that unconsciously to myself. You know, in some ways I, I probably on a deeper level probably did feel disturbed by this. So, and I think that, that I, I don't know, and, and maybe other people do the same thing is, and maybe when you talk about compassion fatigue, Maybe that's that's one of the ways that other people are, are that people are dealing with it. So they don't have to admit to themselves that they're not feeling anything, that they have no compassion to give. Is it saying, oh, I'm just drained. I've given too much. Hmm. And I, I mean, if I that's what that's what struck me in this as I did my my own self-examination. Now, short of these structural changes that would relieve these obstacles to compassion, whether it be improving the EMR and solving inbox fatigue and decreasing the administrative burden, like short of fixing all that, how can physicians today maintain a semblance of compassion? Because let's be honest, it's, it's unlikely that any of these obstacles are going to go away anytime soon. So what kind of tips can you give to physicians who may be overwhelmed by all of these burdens that prevents them from giving the compassion they should? I'm so glad you, you asked that, Kevin, because I have the answer. I have the answer for you. And it's a very simple answer, but it's really difficult. All it is, all it takes is one flip of the mind switch. And let me tell you how I came to this wisdom about that. So I was seeing a patient, a young woman. She's actually works, she worked at Kaiser. She was in the member assistance program, uh, the, which is actually patient complaint department. So I, I said to her, you know, wow, you must have a real, and this is the wisdom. I mean, this young woman had this great solution, this great wisdom, and and I hope I can share it with people. So, and I said, gosh, how do you, how do you do this? I mean, you've got, must have the toughest job. People are always yelling at you, screaming at you. You're the, you're the guilty one. I mean, every time they have to wait in the doctor's office for 20 minutes, or they're looking for parking for 30 minutes, or, you know, they're at home waiting for the doctor's phone call that doesn't come that, you know, they're, they're screaming, yelling. And here's what she said. And I just think there's so much wisdom in this. And she says, you know, you're, you're right. It is a tough job. She says, but what I do, here's what I do. I try to put myself in their shoes. I try to think of myself as, as, as waiting in the doctor's office for 30 minutes in the exam room and I have to pick up my daughter at daycare. I think about what it's like to be driving around for 30 minutes trying to find a parking place, you know, feeling frazzled and frustrated. I think about what it's like to be home with my child, sick, waiting for a doctor's phone call. She says, I put myself in their shoes. And she says, you know what? She says, I know my job is tough, but I love it. Hmm. And so my advice, my advice, and here's what I tried to follow. 
is, is if we can put ourselves just for a moment in our patient's shoes. And so that, so if we try to imagine what it's like for that guy with chronic back pain who can't play catch with his son or the guy with the, with the chronic headaches who, who lies awake at night thinking it might be an aneurysm that's going to bust or, or someone with a, a chronic cough that's just up all night and doesn't get any sleep. What's it like? And there's, if we can put ourselves in their shoes for, for, for just a moment, I, that and forgetting about changing the EMR or, or just all the systemic changes that maybe could be changed in medicine, that simple flip of the mindset. And Kevin, it's believe me, you know, it's not easy. And I can tell you this, if I have one regret, I, I practiced for over 40 years. If I have one regret in all those years of practice, it's that I didn't understand this lesson for so many years. It was only at the end of my my you know years at Kaiser that I that I really understood this and learned this and it was it was still hard it's still hard because you're still under the same pressures but I think at least in that in that way there, there may be salvation we're talking to Scott Abramson he's a retired neurologist and today's Kevin MD article is titled the myth of compassion fatigue Scott Tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. Well, I think that John Maxwell said this. He said, he said, instead of trying to put people in their place, we should try to put ourselves in their place. That would be the message. And Kevin, I was thinking about this one story that, that really impacted me in this regard. Did I, did I ever, I don't know if I ever told you the story about the, the three most intelligent words a doctor can utter. Go ahead. And, okay. <laughs> so this is, this is the three most intelligent words a doctor can order. So when I was doing my training in, as a neurology resident, I rotated through this, through this hospital and they were doing these, this procedure for MS patients. And these were the worst of the worst. And they were putting these spinal cord stimulators now, I was a resident, I was a low man on the totem pole. My job was just to go interview these people, do an exam and document their history. And, and it was really, these people came from all over the country and they were, these were people in the prime of life, just, just shut down in the prime of life. They were in wheelchairs or bed bound. They were looking for any hope. They were desperate. And they would all ask the same, they would all ask the same question. They would say, you know, once you got talking to them, they'd say, why me? Hmm. Why me, Lord? Why me, Lord? Now, the, I worked under the, the chief resident of surgery was a guy named Sergio, Sergio Pacheco, Dr. Sergio Pacheco. And he had, he answered that question with the three most intelligent words I ever heard. Because they would, they would say, why me? Why me? Why, why me, Lord? And what he would do, he would sit at the bedside. He would look in their eyes. Sometimes he'd take their hands. And then he would utter those three most intelligent words. He would say, I don't know. I don't know. And the thing is, Kevin, people, people didn't want an answer. They knew there was no answer. All they wanted to know is, did you hear the question? Are you listening? Are you walking in my shoes? And for that brief moment, I know that Dr. Pacheco was walking in their shoes. Scott, thank you so much again for sharing your perspective, time, and insight, and thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it.